ground zero. It is one of those phrases in the English language that in one moment of time was brought into all of our vocabularies. Have you ever been to ground zero? You may or may not recall that in the days just following September the 11th, 2001, that the United States federal government was carrying out training exercises in preparation for a potential terrorist attack at the Oconee Nuclear Power Plant. Did you know that? Wow. And we had a startling reminder that Ground Zero could be not all that far away. Have you ever been to Ground Zero? The pictures which flooded our television screens and filled our print media of Ground Zero and Lower Manhattan on and in the days following 9-11-2001 told a daunting story, didn't they? Those who though have actually been there to the site said the pictures were not and did not capture the scope of the devastation. Ground Zero is an experience film can't fully record or video completely convey. Listen just for a moment to a first-hand account of one New Yorker who on Wednesday, September the 12th, 2001, the morning after, made his way to Ground Zero. He said, I turned the corner and came face to face with a group of firefighters putting out fire from tower number seven. A building was slumped over, oozing smoke and water. It looked like a helpless whale gasping and dying on the beach. I then moved past skeletal cars, buses, and rescue vehicles toward Tower 1. I arrived at that location in the first moments that rescuers were stepping onto the delicate debris and twisted wreck, and I immediately joined them. We made a bucket brigade, a line, and started digging, and I went to the front of the line near the digging, and we began to hand the debris back through the line. In front of me was a block-wide block crater filled with metal and mortar, and to my left was a giant hole with a ladder leading downward. Dogs were snipping for bodies, and about 10 to 15 men crawled through long lengths of foundation trying to get into crevices. The still standing facade of some of the building looked like a honeycomb sculpture stabbed into the ground. Most of what we dug through was plaster, concrete, and office ground paperwork, tons and tons of paperwork, printouts of employee review sheets, email correspondences, training guides, and inner office memos. He said, I saw a penny loafer, a black high heel shoe, a raggedy and doll, pieces of a desk, a jacket, dust, twisted metal. Two bodies were pulled out from three levels below the ground in body bags. One looking like a black latex cocoon strapped to a stretcher, the other like a hefty bag filled with kitchen trash. But there were no more bodies found between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. as the rescuers went three levels below Earth to look. He said, as I began to walk out of the scene towards home, I kept a steel claw tool in my hand wanting to stay authentic to the end so I'd have no hassles at all. It didn't matter. No one was interested in why I should or shouldn't be there, for everyone was focused on the rescue effort. And the mood, the mood in there was not grim. It was not solemn. It was not sad, even. It was workmanlike. It was calm and efficient and empowering. The only time it felt sad was when I'd see groups of rescuers exhausted eyes wet and red from being up all night, the realities of how huge a mission this is. He said the rest of the country should know this. The world should know that New Yorkers have their heads held high today, he said on that September the 12th, that we're not going to let our grief keep us from being in the streets and doing what's right to save and protect ourselves. 
People are doing everything from volunteering on the side of the disaster to baking cookies for medical technicians to standing on the West Side Highway with homemade signs cheering the fire engines that are coming into town, some as far away as Ohio. We are strong Americans and New Yorkers, and the world and our fellow countrymen need to know this. Nobody comes into our town and brings us down. No. So he said, so please keep praying and offering your support and know that our heads are held high today in New York. Ground Zero. <clears throat> Ground Zero is a place of paradox. It's a symbol of the very best and the absolute worst in humanity side by side. Ground Zero tells a story daunting in the power of evil to destroy. The sight of a Raggedy Ann doll in the rubble without the arms of a four-year-old to hold her. Well, that has the fingerprints of the evil one all over it. And then, in just the day following, there were those religious charlatans, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, they blasphemed our holy and good God when they suggested that God had removed his protective hand from the care of that little one who once held the rag band doll to allow this to happen to prove a point to America. In my theology, God doesn't prove points by terrorizing the mother right. of raggedy Ann dolls. No, those who orchestrated those deeds on that dreadful day, deals, deeds of devastation and death, they weren't working for my God. No, they were marching in an army that since the exit from the Garden of Eden has been doing battle against everything good and decent and just and pure and right that God has ever created. For the price of love, which is free will, God permits their existence, but in no way does God condone or plan or participate in their actions. No, the dust and twisted metal and death that day at Ground Zero was purely on the hands of Satan and his demonic warriors. But Ground Zero also told another story equally as daunting as the story of evil. It is a story of the human spirit's rugged determination for good and the human heart's unrelenting devotion to our bonds with one another as God's children. I went back and looked, and I wrote these, these following words on a couple weeks after 9-11. I wrote these words. I said, for now 12 days, the buckets have been passed from hand to hand. The flickering hopes of rescuing live bodies has extinguished, but the deep reverence for the remains and for giving respectful closure to the families glows like an eternal flame. Night and day, rescuers work on and something or someone drives them who is far more powerful than any act of terrorism could imagine. Ground Zero. Have you ever been to Ground Zero? Well, most of us perhaps have never experienced a Ground Zero on the massive scale of that event. Perhaps we all know, in a lesser but maybe more personal way, something of what Ground Zero is like. For it's the strike which comes completely unexpected. One moment life seems to be humming along in a certain direction, following a familiar pathway, and then in an intersection of time, dropping like an explosive right before us, the landscape of life can be unalterably changed. Those folks who went to work at the World Trade Center or the Pentagon or boarded an airplane on September 11th, a beautiful Tuesday morning, they were doing things they had done so many times before, and no doubt they all had in their minds what the next hours or days would hold, and no doubt their families had plans and dreams and hopes for them and their future. And then they were suddenly at ground zero. And everything had changed. 
and as a whole nation, that event changed us for a while. For a while. The Old Testament scripture that I read to you from Prophet Jeremiah, at first glance, it doesn't seem to offer really many answers or any kind of comfort, does it? In fact, when, when I first came across those words, I, I thought, oh, I don't know if I could preach from Jeremiah. <laughs> For one thing, he's pretty down on himself. He voices a sense of discouragement and disappointment and disillusionment. John Claypool, who was a Baptist turned Episcopal minister, taught part-time at my seminary. He, he wrote a book several years back about various characters of the Old Testament. And he said two things about Jeremiah are important for us to remember. One is Jeremiah was negative about himself. Jeremiah was one of those who had answered God's calling, kicking and screaming. And for much of his ministry, he doubted that he had the right stuff to be a prophet. John Claypool said, I believe the story of Jeremiah was in part about how God struggled to change the tape that was playing inside of Jeremiah's head. How God mercifully and patiently retold Jeremiah's story to Jeremiah until he finally became re-educated emotionally and, and he learned to accept this important truth, this life-changing truth. God loves you, Jeremiah. Amen. Just as you are. The other reason for Jeremiah's agony, says John Clay Poole, was the particular time in which Jeremiah lived. He said, we need to remember that nations, just like persons, can get sick and waste away and finally die. And Jeremiah happened to be born in an era when Israel as a nation was terminally ill. Jeremiah's ministry was dated somewhere between the years 626 B.C. and 587 B.C. And in that time period, the Babylonians, who were an enemy of the Israelites, had captured Jerusalem, the capital city, the center of the religious life of Israel, and had destroyed the temple, which would be like the capital of the United States being bombed into to dust. And they had captured the king of Israel, which meant David's throne would be vacated forever. It was a horrible period for any child of Abraham to have to live through. And added to Jeremiah's problems was the fact that Jeremiah was one of those people who had seen what was coming before most other people did. And he advocated a stance of realistic acceptance. But, but such perception was ahead of its time. It was against the grain. And almost everybody around him ended up hating Jeremiah. Killed the messenger, right? As in many cases of terminal illness, a great sense of unreality pervaded Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time. They had not been true to their covenant with God. They had not done justly. They had not loved mercy. They had not walked humbly with their God. And therefore, there was little cohesive community among them. The rampant injustices of the court and the marketplace had so polarized the people, had torn them apart. The people were at such odds with one another that nothing seemed to unite them or inspire them. Does that sound at all familiar? Yet they persisted in their notions of innocence and special divine favor. They thought Jerusalem would be saved, no matter what. And when, Jer and when Jeremiah stated plainly that this could not be, well, they attacked Jeremiah rather than their real problems. It was in this atmosphere of hopelessness about anything ever changing that Jeremiah speaks these words. He said, my joy is gone, my heart is sick, grief is upon me. For the hurt of my people, I am hurt. I mourn and dismay. Is there no balm in Gilead? 
Is there no physician there? You see, Jeremiah saw people at ground zero, and he wondered how and where and when healing would come. Is there no balm in Gilead? You see, the balm of Gilead was a tree that produced a sap, which was widely used at that time as a healing ointment. And when we are hurting, when we find ourselves at ground zero, we look for something, don't we? For something or someone to soothe us and comfort us and hold us and uplift us and strengthen us and rescue us and take our pain away. There's a reason drugs are on our streets. At ground zero, the landscape has dramatically changed. And all we may have thought would sustain us is no more. And we wonder from where will our support come? What are we to do? How will we heal? Is there a balm in Gilead to heal our sin-sick souls? To answer that question with any integrity, I think, requires us to draw upon our own experiences, our own ground zero, Whatever, whatever scope it might take. You see, I can only answer that question from my own experience at Ground Zero. Now, the closest I think I've probably come in my 57 plus years, and I've experienced some loss in my life, but March 6, 2000, now, many of you know how the word cancer can unalterably change the landscape of life, right? I thought about that day when Gene was diagnosed and what we did to get through it. Was there a balm in Anderson that day? Well, I, I recall so distinctly Gene and I driving home from the AnMed North Campus that morning after her diagnosis and we get into the house and for a moment it was like both of us knew not what to do we just kind of looked at one another but then we went to the telephone and I called Jean's mom first and then our son Michael and then our friend Carla Heritage and then Jean was admitted to the hospital and ended up because she can't do anything on a small scale Staying there 40 days. And at one point, I remember I just had to talk to my parents. I couldn't find them. That was before cell phones, you know. But I got a hold of my grandma, and she tracked them down. Because we all sometimes just need that, right? No matter what our age. But what a testimony Gene and I can give to you to the healing power of a loved one's voice. And that was certainly what we saw on September the 11th, right? Of all the things that are so difficult to remember about that day were the phone calls that were recorded, cell phone calls, from so many who picked up their phones because they knew more than anything, they simply had to get a hold of the people they loved to say, I love you. And then I remember the fourth call I made that day we learned about her diagnosis was to a lady whose name, Jenny, her name was Jenny Ruth Smith. She was a faithful member at Toxaway United Methodist Church because I knew if I called her, she'd start the power of those prayers for us. And I can say without question or reservation, there is balm in the prayers of God's people. Yeah, yeah. And I think we all can say without question or reservation, that our nation was sustained in those days following 9-11 by the fact that God's people finally got together and started getting serious about praying. You remember? There were prayer gatherings all over the place. I remember some in our own community. Do you not? Let us pray that that, that sort of heightened interest in prayer might return. 
Yes, there's a bomb in Gilead. There's a bomb at Ground Zero. 